some water here. Thank you, brother. Good evening. I will try to keep the mic a little higher tonight. Sorry if uh, you weren't able to hear as well last night. So I'll try to do good. If I if it drops down, though, you guys motion for me some easy thing like or whatever. <laughs> or I really respond to this one. <laughs> this I respond to too. I know what that means. <laughs> I'm used to all those things, <laughs> so you, you won't offend me. You may make me laugh, but you won't offend me. So <laughs> anyway, the Lord is good. Appreciate our time before the Lord tonight, don't you guys? Appreciate you guys and just the adoration, the thanksgiving, the praise, the exaltation of Jesus. Thank you, guys. It's not easy. Um, <laughs> I've been in situations, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have too, trying to lead people into anything, uh, even to the bathroom, isn't it? <laughs> so I appreciate you guys. I want you to tell you that and appreciate your own hearts. It comes out clearly before the Lord. So I uh, appreciate all you guys here. Um, what a journey, hi huh, guys? What a journey. And we have only started as the way I see it. I don't see an end to this journey other than being found in Christ. And um, all that that is meant to mean for each of us and all of us collectively looking at it worldwide. So, but let me just encourage your hearts to stay in the journey. And don't be discouraged because you're surely going to fight that. All of us are. Uh, you only have to look around at what's going on in our nation and get discouraged real easy. It's just uh, chaos is a bonus, I'm afraid. But having said that, where we fix our eyes, let it be Jesus. And uh, he is the Prince of Peace. And it don't matter the storm. Storms will come and go. The Lord will outlast them all. Don't you know? It's the truth. So we are, we're going to jump in again tonight and uh, uh, back into some of what we started to share last night. Go a little bit more detail and uh, depth in depth into some of what I'm trying to, to present to the body of Christ at this time, really with a theme, as I said last night, a theme of readiness, and that being particularly true if we're going to look at uh, unto the end. And I say that because there is an end. Uh, and aren't we looking for it? We were talking about this on the way over tonight. Man, guys, I long for the reign of the Lamb, don't you? I long for this evil age to come and go and for the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ upon this earth to begin, don't you? And for that 1,000 year time frame to when we can eat what we want to and not gain any weight. I'm going to have ice cream every day. Corn on the cob. I mean... Non-GMO, too. I'm convinced. <laughs> Doesn't that sound good? I mean, I'm ready for the millennium right now. <laughs> but anyway, I, seriously, we weren't made for this evil day. God never intended for it to exist. But we're in it. But it will not go on forever. This evil will not last. <clears throat> the Lord who conquered the enemy is going to, in His time, Finish it off and put it away. Stop using it, because he has been. He can use even the devil. So, but in God's time, not mine, I'm ready now, but obviously the Lord's not. <laughs> in God's time, he's going to put it all away. Roll the whole thing up and be done with it. Anyway, my point is, our hearts ache for the reign of the Lamb. I'm there with you ready for that new day. But until that day, I want him to reign in me, don't you? 
and be the source of life and peace that only he can be in all times including times like this we're not the first to face difficulties um, I will say though here at the end the greatest time of difficulties will exist we will be faced with a world system that is the best that man has ever offered it will be in many ways the most beautiful man created system that has ever existed on this earth for a time there will be peace in it not the peace of God but peace there will be provision there will be in the economic realms uh, a release of resources and finances and those type of things that will be unparalleled I'm only sharing this you know as a reason why I'm taking us down the road I started taking us down last night for us to see that the beast is a beast from God's perspective but from the perspective of the world that beast system will appear to be the answer to people's hearts desire for what's called the church much of it the answer to prayer but we'll all be deceived if that's our view anyway so much so much more can be said about that Satan realizing that this will be his final and he will know that he'll know his time is short and he'll know that this is his final deceptive act upon the world will bring forth a beast system present it to the world and much of the world is going to follow after the beast we have been primed and readied for this I'm talking about natural man now and his own desire to uh, to be his own Lord his own King his own source in every kind of way and now I'm afraid that much of what calls itself the church separating that which is real from that which is that which is not the true church though and I'm obviously are meaning God's people in reality inwardly not just church going people I'm not trying to say that in an offensive way but you guys know what I know not everybody who goes to church is a Christian even not everybody who preaches is a Christian I mean good night well part of the major problem with what's called the church today is most of the people standing behind the pulpit don't have a living personal relationship with Jesus Christ they're preaching about a God they don't know not intimately not personally learned about him in college and they're sort of regurgitating everything that they heard all that they can read that's far too much the truth of the day we live in you have only to go to the Bible colleges and see what I'm saying is true that's all you got to do go meet the professors most of them are not even born again most of them are teaching the young people that the miracles of the Bible were not true that's what's going on and I'm talking about Pentecostal Bible colleges that's what's happening been happening for several years turning out young men and women who if they go into what's called the ministry the concept of ministry is not unto the Lord it's unto a paycheck anyway enough of that the state of things is not good <clears throat> to be a minister of the Lord doesn't take a degree it just takes knowing Jesus <laughs> and it's not a pulpit type of thing at all I mean it's not that there's not those I'm standing behind this one right now but I'm saying this all of us here are ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ 
because he's in us. Isn't that true? That's not a job. It's a life. So uh, I'm saying this. We're, we've come to, in our time, and coming more so into it, an extraordinarily difficult time. On the one hand, people are promoting every type of evil activity, even now within what's called the church, making excuses for it, allowances for it, and then simultaneously out the other side of their mouth saying, don't judge. Now, man, let me just say this to all of us in the room. We better have some sense of judgment. I'm not talking about a judgment of people. I'm saying a discernment. We better have some discernment. We better know the distinction between light and dark, between God and evil. Don't you think? And if we don't in the body of Christ, just who does? If we're called to be a city set on a mountain, Matthew 5, and we don't have discernment, man, are we in trouble. So anyway, so going back to our Hebrews 4 passage, this discerning of soul and spirit, we are speaking about this and God's capacity to do just that, to distinguish between soul and spirit and to help us by inhabiting us to know the difference. That's the key. To have the discernment of the Spirit is to be inhabited in a fuller way by Christ. Know the real and you'll perfectly see the counterfeit. It isn't so much important that I know what's soulish, it's important that I know Jesus. It's important that I understand there is a soul and spirit issue. But I'm not going to discern the soul by knowing the soul. Man, guys, we already know the soul. We've been living it for a long time. <laughs> I know that's not funny. It's just the truth. <laughs> I can say that about myself. And if you can't say that about yourself, don't say it. But who's kidding who here? If you don't believe it about yourself, ask somebody who does. Get a different, you know, we do this with doctors. Get a different opinion, a second one. Anyway, no, the truth of this is uh, my objective is not simply just to lay out, though I'm going to do some of this, what's coming in the soul. What's going to prepare us, prepare us and make us ready is the knowing of the Lord. I would have us concentrate. I, I know you know this, but let me say it clearly. I would have us so concentrating upon knowing Him and being drawn into that love relationship that our security lies in that reality. Christ in me is God's discernment in me. To the measure that Christ inhabits me will be the measurement that I have the discernment between soul and spirit. That's the way everything is meant to work. The measure of Christ in me is the measure of the life of Christ in me. And the measure of the life of Christ in me is the measure of the love of God in me. The measure of the wisdom of God in me, in you. What am I saying in all that? I'm just saying what's simple to all of us. We all understand it. Christ is the sole source of God. It's true spirituality. There is no other. No other is needed. He's who the Father gave. And He is completely and totally sufficient for us. We don't have to go looking any other direction. In Christ, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. I'm going to say that again. In Christ, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. God's full thought, God's full desire, God's full purpose 
is there in Christ. God's full work can only be done by Christ, accomplished by Christ. And I'm talking about in us now. The outer part has already been accomplished. It's the inward part that's being worked on now. He's already went and accomplished the outward, the cross. Now he's bringing that reality into a people. And there's the inward work in the now moment of what God is doing. He's not building an outward kingdom. He's building a people. Aren't you thankful? His eyes on you. Not bricks and mortar and stone and wood. God's not in love with things. He's in love with you. That's good news, isn't it? That's a gospel that needs to be proclaimed. So let's uh, <clears throat> look now at Jude. I, I've just mentioned the Hebrews passage. We've been mentioning it so much. But it's this distinction of soul and spirit that's going to be needed. And again, that's coming for us. It's coming from a knowing of the Lord Jesus Christ. But therein lies the rub in what's called the church. So my encouragement comes with a warning to the church of Jesus Christ to wherever this is going, and the Lord has seen fit for it to go all over the world. The encouragement comes with a warning to encourage us to draw near to God to come in further than ever before into Christ, to be willing to go all the way into Christ, into the life that He is, and to be completely possessed by Him inwardly. It's twofold, John 14. It's not only Christ coming into us, but it's Christ, uh, us coming into Christ. Both are said in the same passage. So to want to be filled with Christ is half of it. The other half is the coming into Christ. To be filled with Christ is to be filled with the life. But to come in Christ is to come into eternal purpose. And to become, uh, and let's say it this way, one with that purpose. One with that intent. One with the divine thought. And let's say it this way, there's a lot of people we know who have the germ of Christ in them. And that's about all they have, the germ. So it takes to be born again. But uh, they're not allowing the Lord to come in in a fuller way into them as life. They're still living their life. Still living it as they see fit to live it. Some of them even saying, I'm living for God. But God's not after us living for Him. He's after Christ to live in us and Christ to live through us and to us live by the life of another who now lives in us. So that Galatians 2.20 is realized, I no longer live. Christ lives in me. That's a journey. That's not a given. That's not a salvation statement. That's down the road. Let's just be honest for a moment. When the germ that cries, let's see the seed of life I'm talking about, that seed is germ size in its initial portion. When the seed that Christ is enters us, we're living for ourselves still. As long as He remains germ, seed, we're still living for ourselves. God has more than that for us, for all of us, doesn't He? So, <clears throat> I make a choice as to how much I want to be filled with Him who is the life. How much I want to embrace an entirely different life. And, and let me say this. When I'm talking about life, guys, I'm not talking about what we see. We're talking about God's life, uncreated, without beginning, without end. God's life that has forever existed. I want us to think this through for a moment. God's life that his expression has nothing to do with his creation. In this sense, that his creation can show what God's life is like. The only way to know God's life is to have Christ inside of you. 
And let me say this. Please hear what I'm trying to convey. Language is limited. God's life being eternal, uncreated, cannot be expressed by created things. Not fully. Cannot be known that way. When Christ came to this earth, he had, and he was, that divine life. Nothing he ever did caused that life to increase in him because that life can't be increased. Not the life. The life can fill us and thus God is increasing in us, but God doesn't increase. He's just taking more of us. God doesn't grow. God doesn't mature. God doesn't get better or worse. See my point? There's nothing that Christ did on this earth that added one iota to the life that he already was. Now, I want to hit this with us. Do we really believe that what we do or don't do is going to add to the life of Christ? Now, here's what I'm not saying, because people get in a ditch as to what they think or say. Well, just live like you want to. That is not what I'm saying. I'm talking about an altogether other than life. It is an other than life than anything you've ever seen on this earth. It has no evil in it whatsoever. It is God's life. No darkness is in it. No taint, no shadow whatsoever. So we bought into the lie believing that if we do certain things it'll make us more spiritual or that we don't do certain things. That'll make us spiritual. Spirituality does not come by that way. It's a matter of the life of Christ. And it's a matter of being possessed. If we can become more spiritual without Christ in us, we don't need Christ. That's the cold hard facts of this. Again, God's plan is to inhabit us and be. And God help us in this. To stay locked and loaded with Him in this truth. His work is within us. He's already accomplished the outward work needed to bring this primary work to us. An inward work within us believers. And whosoever will come to Him. That's the moment we're in. In the coming age of ages, every single age to come, each age will be marked by a fresh revelation of whom the Son of God is. It will govern the entire age that is coming and the age of ages beyond. So if we're not comfortable with Jesus, uh, we might want to rethink where we're at and who we're in love with. And what the purpose and plan of God is. So, let's get back to Jude. Now, Jude's one of those books, I believe, that is a, a truly set this way. It's a book for all time, but if there's a book that I could say, hey, uh, keep this one locked and loaded in the now moment, if there's a book I could say that about, it'd be the book of Jude. Take that for what it's worth. That, you don't have to feel that way about it. I just do. I feel that way about it. <clears throat> there are warnings in here. There are encouragements in here. There are things that are said in this brief book that is extraordinarily important for our times. Our times. What we're faced with. So, we could just read the whole thing, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> I'm tempted to, but maybe I shouldn't. Instead, we're just going to focus in upon what my, my purpose here is really to be. Uh, verse number 11 of Jude. Woe to them. They're speaking about false teachers here. You have false prophets, false teachers. Um, what makes them false? Their lack of the truth as it is in Jesus. 
That's what makes everyone false. What makes us false is not because we do or don't believe in the rapture. What makes one false is the lack of Jesus Christ. And not just Jesus Christ as an add-on, but Jesus Christ as the truth. A lot of people trying to take what we're saying and add it to where they are. It don't add. It destroys. God's not coming to add to Christ. He's coming for the domination of Christ. He comes to break us with Christ. Break what, Terry? Our life outside of Him. Our will outside of Him. Our desires outside of Him. Our destiny outside of Him. Our purpose and intent outside of Him. It could go on and on. Our self-life, the power of our souls, not annihilation, but devastation of the soul. He's not annihilating the soul, He's devastating it. He's subjugating it and bringing it under Him. Away from its own dominion. I've seen this over and over where people just try to take everything said, just leads to confusion. Take everything that's said, and I want to add, when it fits here, it don't fit. It's not meant to fit. It's meant to destroy. I know that. I've had to walk through it myself. <laughs> I had a former life, too. I had a former ministry, too, all over the world. And all I'm saying to us is, guys, are we willing to let the Lord get His way? Are we willing to completely walk away from all that we thought we knew and embrace the dying of the Lord? The dying of the Lord. Death to all that is not Christ. Because that's where it is actually anyway, in death. Because only Christ is the life. And are we willing to embrace that? Can we take that hit? Can we take that blow? Or we do, do we get offended? Well, you don't know what I know. Guys, it's not what we know, it's who we know. So uh, I'm saying that as kindly as I can. If we're looking, well, let's place this over here tonight. That kind of thinking is stinking thinking. <laughs> Just get us into trouble. Let the Lord break you. The measure of the brokenness in Christ operating in us will be the measure of the fullness of Christ operating in us. And there's no other way in this. To refuse to be broken is to refuse to be filled. God cannot fill a cup already full. He'll empty it every time. So anyway, was that too heavy? Of course I said it anyway, it didn't really matter. But it's my heart for God's people. I recognize what's going on. I understand the battle. I understand what these words mean and what they strike. I can see it in the spirit. I can see what's going on, you know. And it doesn't offend me, but it does. I just want to say this to us. I want to address some things in the heavenlies for a moment. This city is building up an immunity to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the Atlanta area. It's soulish path, 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 and, and path, and past, both. But it's soulish present past, and path is building up this immunity to Christ. We're outgrowing Jesus. New sources are appearing in this city. Things that have never been in this city before. Now I'm talking demonically. That have come in with what's come into your city. That never existed here. Now they're wanting to claim this territory as their own. And they don't want Jesus in any form having any ground in any heart. We're in a fight for the souls of men. Starting with our own.
It isn't going to get any better. We're not going to be able to yell at them and topple them. We've got way too much in this city for that to be the case in an easy sort of way. What we would see, at least this, we would see God get a people out to himself. I'm after everyone who wants to come out, aren't you? But I recognize it'll end up being a remnant because few want to come out. Now I'm talking about the church. Few want to come out of the, the confusion of the church, the delusion of the church. You live in confusion long enough and it becomes your reality. You live in delusion long enough and it becomes your desire. I would ask, I better not say it. I'm only, man, guys, for me, it's whatever it takes for people to get out to the Lord. I don't care if it is a bloodbath in this city. I don't much care. I care about people, but somebody, somewhere, this is going to be true, something's got to be interrupted. Something's got to be interrupted here. I remember back a few years ago in Nashville when God did an interruption. Of course, nobody wanted to recognize the fact of it. So he sent what they called a thousand-year flood into the city. Cut the city completely off. Flooded the, the lower area of Nashville where the musicians keep all their instruments. That building was flooded. They lost all kinds of instruments. But no one ever wanted to face the facts that our city has become something completely other than what God's intention was for Nashville. And that started back some years ago. And that we had a history in Nashville of a move of God that swept through the city in the late 1800s and early 1900s. At that time, there were 63 taverns in that city and every one of them shut down. And within a hundred mile radius around the city of Nashville, the presence of God could be tangibly, tangibly felt. But that's been forgotten. And there was a, an occurrence that occurred during that move of God when was it Sam Jones was speaking and uh, Reinman, who was a riverboat captain, in Nashville wanted to uh, come and beat up Sam Jones who was preaching Christ in this move of God that was going on and Reinman with his cronies came to the meeting to beat up Sam Jones and instead Reinman got saved got born again <laughs> and then financed the building of what became a Union Gospel Tabernacle it took him seven years to build it Reinman financing it and then it happened Reinman dies years later. He had spoke clearly before he died that if the fire ever went, ever went out in Nashville, God would bring it back to flame. That was the basic prophecy concerning the city. And so uh, man's name got elevated above God's, and here's how it happened. What was Union Gospel Tabernacle became the Reinman Auditorium. And that's how easy it is. And what God purposed was songs of the Lamb to come out of that city and to arise to Him. But country music did instead. That's the cold, hard, spiritual facts. What happens when the soul arises? Reinman would have never stood for that had he been living. But it happened. Atlanta has a God destiny that's worth fighting for. A people worth fighting for. Doesn't it, guys? I believe you're worth fighting for. I believe you believe like I do. There's a people here in this city worth fighting for. Their souls. I do not applaud 
all that's going on in Nashville, nor Atlanta, nor many cities across our nation. I cannot applaud the influx of such evil, scheming people who have no appreciation for the Son of God. There may be God language, but the stumbling block of this is Christ. You know what I mean? Cannot applaud that. Instead, I would ask God to resist their moving here. I don't care if it is a loss of jobs. I'd rather be impoverished and know Jesus than have the wealth of the wicked. How about you? I mean, somewhere down the line, there's got to be a line drawn. Got to be one. Anyway, I got to get off this subject. But now I'm just trying to do a history lesson as much as I'm saying this. You got a fight going on for your city. And may we see the bigger picture of it. You got a fight going on for this body. I ran into it directly a couple of weeks ago before we came here. Of a spirit over Marietta that does not want Christ being proclaimed as he is being proclaimed here among you, being released among you. Doesn't want it. Doesn't want it in this city of Marietta. Of course, what they don't like is what exactly we will do like. So, you know, we're on a collision course in this. But guys, it's worth fighting for. It's worth being involved in the war. I hope we don't have anything better to do. I hope. All right, so Jude, <clears throat> verse 11, finally. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And I'm going to just stop right there. They have gone the way of Cain. And now, having read that, I'm going to read a little bit out of 1 Corinthians 15, just a few short passages. Then we're going to jump to the book of Genesis. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse number 45 of 1 Corinthians 15. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, this is speaking of Christ, who's the last of Adam. In other words, God's saying this to us through the Apostle Paul. Christ is the putting away of Adam. The putting away of the living soul. Again, we're not talking about the annihilation of the soul. We're talking about the domination of the soul. The subjugating of the soul. Christ is the end of that kind of soul life. He is the end of Adam. He is the last of him. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, this will show you what God thinks about the soul life. The spiritual is not first. That's God's word about it. Soul life is not spiritual. Not ever. Christ is. <laughs> However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Then the spiritual. Christ. The first man is from the earth. Made right from it. Made from the soil. All humanity had their beginning right there with Adam and his wife. There can be no boasting in our flesh. God does not allow it. It does not matter what your bloodline is. You are only boasting in dirt. <laughs> Jew, Gentile, it does not matter. You're boasting in dirt. And if you're boasting in dirt, and let's say it this way, if you're boasting in the distinction that was in Adam, you're boasting in division that God never meant to exist. There was never meant to be a Jew, never meant to be a Gentile. They should have never existed. Only sin brought it forth. Never meant to be slave nor free. That was never the will of God, David. And it never will be. 
sin brought it forth. Never to be, let's say it this way, a racial issue between the male and the female. That was the first source. A racial issue was male and female. It should have never existed. It was never meant to exist. There's never meant to be a competition between the male and the female. Never meant to be a battle over who's got the authority, who's in control. It was always meant to be God, not the husband. <laughs> not the wife. But that's original intent, guys, isn't it? Original intent. And the church has drifted so far away from this. And we pride ourselves now on what should have never existed. I talk about some of that within the circle of the throne. Everything's resolved when you see that what we're bragging about was never meant to exist. Then we hit it really hard. Wow. If that be true, then where is my boast? The scripture answers, answers that only in the Lord. So, the first man is from the earth, and he's earthy. The second man is from heaven. Two entirely different men, two entirely different lives, different sources. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthly. As is the earthly, so are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. It should be translated this way, verse 46, or verse 49, excuse me. If we have borne the image of the earthly, let us also bear the image of the heavenly. That would be Christ in us. So it should be translated. That's its right translation. It's what's being said. We already are bearing the image of the earthly. That's an outward reality. You can't get away from it. But when it comes to Christ and bearing his image, you're not talking about an outward thing here. You're talking about an inward life. Christ, our life. A kingdom, Luke 17, that is within you. That image. So now let's get to Genesis 4, okay? I just wanted to devastate any view of Adam and his kin that could possibly imagine there being something to redeem in Adam. There is nothing to redeem in Adam but his soul. What are you saying in that, Terry? I'm saying this. God's not after redeeming something in Adam that is useful to God. Nothing is. God's pronouncement upon it is death. Now, I want us to see that starting in Genesis. It actually starts before that in Genesis 3. 15, but we're going to go to Genesis 4 and look at two men, two brothers here, and then come forward. I, I know I'm being ponderous in this. I'm, I'm trying to take a little time with this to say some things that are meant to be clear, meant to draw a difference between Adam and Christ, and that God always meant for man to come into the fullness of Christ. Christ's coming was not determined by a fall. Christ was going to come whether man fall, fell or not. Now, would Christ have to die if man didn't fall? No. But Christ was coming. Adam did not have the life of Christ inside of him. He had soulish life. He was a living soul. He was a spirit being as well, but he was, his soul was where his life was. That was a condition by creation. Now the soul was not above God as of yet at that time. 
though it was in a primary position in Adam's relationship to everything on this level. God was meeting Adam in an outward way because of his soulness, not in an evil way. Here's the soul not evil yet, hasn't fallen. God's meeting with Adam in an outward way, wanting though in time to come into Adam. Simply said, Adam would have to lose his life without a fall. If Adam was ever come to come into the full purpose of God, he would have to willingly choose at the advent of the Lord himself to choose Christ as his life rather than to continue living in his soul. There's a lot more to that, and it's not my point. I've, I've talked about this multiple times throughout um, the years, and there's a lot more on the website for free that you can listen to if you can find it. There's a lot on there. But where I've talked more in depth about this than what I am presently. But I'm getting to something here, here in Genesis chapter 4. These two brothers representing um, more than just Let's say it this way, more than just two lives, but also representing the distinction of soul and spirit in type as pertains to Abel, in full-blown reality as pertains to Cain. He is an example of soul life. So, here it is. <clears throat> now, verse 1, chapter 4. Now, the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. So this is, uh, by the way, here's, here's uh, 1 Corinthians 15. First comes the natural. You'll see that right here. In type and shadow, but here it is. God's going to present it to us in Genesis. No one's going to understand it to uh, the great interpreter of Christ, the Apostle Paul, comes on the scene. A man who writes over half the New Testament books had a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why God used him to write half the New Testament books. Because of his revelation of Christ. Not revelation of the law, revelation of Christ. Not revelation of the soul, the revelation of Christ. Not the revelation of man, the revelation of Christ. See what I'm saying? So, uh, Cain comes first. The natural will come first. And does. She said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And again, verse 2, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Nothing wrong with being a tiller of the ground. Being a farmer has nothing to do with being evil. No more than being a keeper of the flocks is spiritual. Neither one of them is spiritual but they are necessary. And so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. Now, the fact that they're bringing offerings to the Lord, let's just say this, it doesn't say this, but we know this for to be a fact, that they're mother and father knew to do this by direct revelation from God. They would have known, including Cain, they would have known to bring what God had demanded in the offering. This was not an unknown fact for Cain. It's a known fact. I'm saying this. Cain and Abel aren't the only ones bringing offerings. So are Adam. And so is his wife Eve. That's a given. Where are they going to learn this anyway? To bring an offering. You're going to learn it from the Lord. So the Lord's talking. And the Lord's giving clarity. And He's giving direction. And He's giving what He wants. As a type of Christ. So let's go on. But for Cain and for his offering... God had no regard. 
So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, see that in itself shows that he knew better. Or God would not have said that to him. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you. But you must master it. God's calling for obedience rather than direct disobedience. So let's paint Cain in this right picture, I think. Cain is not an ungodly man if we're dealing with godly in this sense of believing in God, knowing that God is the creator. We're not that far removed from the creation here. Knowing that God is the God who spoke, who speaks and spoke to his father. I believe to Eve as well. Of course, this is true by the scripture. Eve knew what not to do, just like Cain would know what not to do, just like Adam would know what not to do. So Cain, I don't want to paint him as some you know, man who is not concerned for God at all. But Cain, here's what I want to hit. Here's the soul in operation. And remember now, Christ isn't in any of these people. So they're soulish beings. They have a spirit, but let me say it this way. Their spirit, I'm not talking about physical size, but their spirit is extraordinarily immature in a relationship with God. Extraordinarily immature. And it's immature in this way. God is a spirit and their soul is where their life presently is. God's having to appear to them in an outward way because that's the only way they can know Him presently. Outwardly they can be told do's and don'ts, but inwardly is a ripe field for the work of the enemy to come in and to bring temptation to them, soulish temptation to them, appealing to their soul, just like he did Adam and his wife Eve, appealing to their soul toward evil. Isn't it beautiful, the fact that we have Christ in us? Thank you for your wonderful response. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. We have Christ in us. Christ in us should mean something of inward discernment, inward reality of life. If we are allowing Christ to possess us, if we're allowing to this I no longer live, Christ lives in me effect, if we're embracing that, if we're embracing a mind outside of our own, the mind of Christ, if we allow God to restrain this front lobe when it comes to spiritual matters, it's good for mathematics, terrible for things in the spirit. Great, thank God that this is great for mathematics. Thank God that it's great for these outward things, but you cannot know God from here. You will never have divine intelligence by knowing God from here. Divine intelligence increases, comes in and increases in us when Christ comes in us. He is the source of the knowledge of God, and only He is. I'm going to say that again. Christ is the source of all divine intelligence. The soul source. There is no other. He is the true knowledge of God. The true wisdom of God. I just want to point that out to us. God help us to not be on a quest of, let's just say, feeding our front lobe information, thinking that that brings to us the knowledge of God. It does not. It brings to us a stumbling block. God cannot be known that way. God is a spirit, and he must be worshipped. Must. Let me say it again. Must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Must be. Not a maybe. It's an absolute. 
God cannot be known by the brain of man. Not ever. God is a spirit. And by the way, we talked a little bit about this. I'm not going to hit all this. Maybe tomorrow morning more. But we talked a little bit about this in 1 Corinthians. About this fact. <clears throat> so, but I'm hitting it hard right now. I'm hitting it hard because, man, guys, we are believing, and so much is being believed in the church with the front lobe or being believed in the soul. And we think it's the knowledge of God, and it's not. The knowledge of God is brought into us in Christ. God reveals himself in and through Christ. So uh, I'm not blaming Cain at this point. I'm simply pointing out what is the results of soul unchecked. And it's come down to us. That's my intent here. My intent is not to revile Cain in any way. But it is to show what happens to me if I'm living in my soul and how open I am to my own self, to my own soul power. How open am I if soul is my life? If I'm living unto myself. If the priority is me. What does that open me up to? Okay, so Cain gets angry at God because God refuses his offering. Cain is offering to God the best in the natural way of his work that he has. He's offering God the best, his best. And God totally dismisses it. It may seem harsh, but here's the reason why. Now, I'm going to say this in a New Testament way, but believe me when I say this again, Cain knew better. It is a principle of God, a life for life. Give up your life if you want the life of Christ. That's principle. It's a divine principle. Every animal that would be sacrificed would point right to that. This life must die if you are to have my son. And here's God's point. Your life, soul life, must die if you are to receive Christ. There can be no mixture. There can be, I want my life and Christ. There is no mixture in this. So the sacrificial and the, off, the altars that would be built and were built were to offer animals a type of the offering of blood. Life, because life is in the blood. Life for life. Represented Christ and his offering in our stead to take the blow, to suffer death for us so that we might have his life. Not that we might live again, but that Christ might live in us. Let me say that again. Christ did not die so that we could live again. Christ died so that he would be the life in us, the only one. We've been, here we just quote the scripture to you. We've been bought with a price. We are not our own. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So Cain offers his best. It's totally rejected by God. And Cain gets angry at the Lord. So angry that he kills the messenger, his brother Abel. Because Abel's testimony of Christ in the offering of these animals is a testimony of Christ. And God only accepts Christ being offered to him. In a beginning way, shadow and type, but not anymore. Here's what I want to say to all of us in the room. What does God accept from us? Christ, who he gave us. Our righteous acts for God are not accepted. Our best for God is not accepted. God has given us Christ. He's the only one that is acceptable to God the Father. Christ. God gave us Christ. God is expecting Christ in and through us back to Him. Hard truth to hear. Man still in his soulless knowledge of God wants to offer his best. I'll offer my best to you, God. I'll give it all away to you. And God completely rejects it. 
This, this is what God the Father has to say about it. This is my beloved son. Shut up and listen to him. That's what he has to say to Peter. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God accepts Christ and accepts Christ in us. Christ through us, not us. You have to hear that. You're meant to be an entirely different creature than Adam. Christ is meant to come in and possess you. Be under the control of the Spirit of God. But we don't like being controlled, do we? Sorry. Let me say it again. We don't like being controlled. We want to do it our way. Do our thing. Be our own person. So did Cain. His defiance is about to be revealed. It's interesting to me how unwilling the church is to come under the hand of the Lord. Interesting to me to watch it. We talk the talk, but in reality, we do not want to be under the control of the Spirit of God. We will kick and fuss and question and doubt that all day long. Generally speaking, not everybody, but generally speaking, that's what goes on. Surely God didn't mean this. <laughs> I suppose Cain could have thought that. Surely God didn't mean that we had to forever offer these animals. He don't have much understanding. Even though the Lord's talking about a coming Messiah in Genesis 3.15, a coming seed. Even though he's talking about that, Cain doesn't have a lot of understanding. Abel doesn't have a lot of understanding. He's just obedient. Cain is disobedient. He offers what God's not prescribed in type and shadow of his son. It doesn't matter what the church wants to offer to the Lord. There's only one thing God's willing to accept, and it's Christ back through us. Christ in us and Christ through us. This belief that we can just throw everything back and dedicate it to God, God doesn't want it. He would bring death to it. He wants Christ. Christ. Boy, isn't this a, just a beautiful message? <laughs> devastating to our flesh. Devastating to our souls. Devastating maybe to my attitude. It was to Cain. I can get angry about this. I can get quite offended over that kind of a statement. God's not accepting. God does not allow my best. My best efforts. My best desires. Oh, but I'm sincere. What does that have to do with anything? You can be sincerely, you and I can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. This is not random with God. God's not random. He don't do random. God is specific and He's on eternal ground and He ain't playing around. Amen. I love Him for that. I tell you what, guys, unless God is specific and unless He has, is absolute miles, unless He is that, He can't be trusted. If he's waffling between one thing and the other and changing his mind and, okay, I'm not going to allow it now, but now I will. Man, you can't trust God. Don't believe in him. But you can trust him. Because he's going to give you the absolute truth and it lies in his son. And there's going to be an absolute. And in this age and in this time, we're not big on absolutes, are we, guys? Our culture doesn't like absolutes anymore. Don't tell me what I can and can't do. Okay. Live for yourself. Face God and see what happens. Is that plain enough? <laughs> Go ahead and tell God what you want and what you're going to do. Go ahead and defy Him like Cain did. I'm not talking really to anybody in this room. I mean, I may be, but I'm not trying to. <laughs> if I'm talking to anybody in this room, it may be me. I'm just saying, here's where the world of the church is now. The world of the church doesn't want to be under the hand of God. The world of the church doesn't want to be corralled. The world of the church wants its so-called liberty, which is absolutely slavery and bondage to itself. We're screaming at the slightest threat of God saying to us, this is what I want. And this, my son, is who I will accept. Anyway, so Cain gets angry and kills the messenger. Isn't that how it always works? 
It's because uh, they can't kill God, they do the next best thing. They kill the other guy or the other lady. They kill the messenger. So the messenger tells them the truth or the messenger's acts are righteous, as is the, the case of uh, Abel. He offers Christ in type and shadow back to the Father and his offering is accepted. Cain is so angry at that that he kills the messenger. People all the time, you know, I love the truth, except when it goes against what I believe. <laughs> Other than that, I really love it. <laughs> it's that kind of thing, isn't it? So, so now God has an interaction with Cain. Cain rises up and kills his brother, and then God has something to say. To Cain, verse 9, where is Abel, your brother? Now God knows where he is. <laughs> he said, I don't know. <laughs> Can you imagine saying that to the Almighty? I don't know where he is. <laughs> Why well, well, you got that dripping uh, rock knife in your hand there? Whatever you had to kill him with. Whatever it is. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> he said, God, here's what he says back to God. Am I my brother's keeper? This slams God. That's his defiance coming out now. Once he chose this path, defiance makes itself in the soul known quickly. It goes from, let me say this to you. It goes from a soulish heart to I offer my best to God quickly to murder. Can you see that? Yes. Both are equally bound up in the soul. There isn't a hair difference between the two. I'll just say it about what's going on in our nation. I talked about it the other last night, this beauty realm so-called, with all its loftiness and high-mindedness and all this stuff that seems so beautiful, so precious is a hair's breadth away from murder. And all this lofty, high-minded stuff are the same people who are agreeing with abortion and the murder of babies. There's your soul. <coughs> Save the seals and kill the children. There's forgiveness. Don't misunderstand me. There's the forgiveness of God for those who have sinned in that way. I'm not trying to bring something down upon people in any form of condemnation. But guys, this one thing of abortion in this nation, the Lord has said this directly to me, is enough for him to judge our nation. Yes. We are murdering the innocent and the unborn. We're murdering them. And up until recently, it's been being funded by our own government. Mm -hmm. So there's your beautiful side of evil. Don't give me your high lofty ideas while you're murdering these kids. I will not listen to it. I want nothing to do with it. <clears throat> there's the soul there's the soul there's the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil same tree same source murder evil and high mindedness the beautiful side of evil and it's the wrong source and it was the source of Cain So God pronounces a curse upon him in verse 11. And now you're cursed. From the ground which, was, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your land, or from your hand, when you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer in the earth, or on the earth. God's curse comes upon him. 
Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me, too great to bear. Behold, thou hast driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from the face, and I shall be hidden, and I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on this earth, and it will come about that whenever or whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, lest anyone finding him should slay him. So God went as far as to put a sign there so that people would know not to kill him. I don't know. He probably rented one along the roadway. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Do not kill Cain. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't think so, do you? <laughs> Number one, there was no money. <laughs> anyway, so Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now, let's see the defiance of Cain. I want us to see this. God says you're going to be a vagrant, you're going to wander, and Cain aims to prove God wrong in his defiance. And here it comes. Cain had relations with his wife, verse 17, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. This isn't the same godly Enoch, of course. It's the same name, not the same person. And he built a city. But God told him he was going to be a wanderer. Now he's going to build a city in direct defiance of God. I wonder how many cities have been built in direct defiance of God. I wonder if all of them have been. <laughs> anyway, sorry. What is this thing about not building cities anyway? Why did God tell, e tell Cain that he was going to be a wanderer? I can tell you why. In a spiritual sense, let me tell you what God was saying to him. I do not want your kind of life getting its roots into civilization. That's what God's saying. I'm going to cause you to wander around because I don't want you raising up a civilization with this kind of life. But he didn't listen, did he? So Enoch, or excuse me, Cain builds a city and he names it after his son, Enoch. And Enoch, to now we're going to get into now, Enoch was born, was born fruit, or excuse me, was born Irad. This is my, my Bible's words are so small. I'm like... <laughs> no, I refuse. <laughs> I hate crutches. <laughs> it's their fault, not my eyes. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> now, to Enoch was born Irad. Now, here's what we're going to see. Here's what I want to see to, to see briefly in the sons of Cain and goes from a city to a civilization and what's entailed in the civilization. So Lamech took to himself two wives, and the name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zilhah. Now, as far as we can tell, this is the first time a man took two wives unto himself. We're dealing with defiance here. We're going to defy all rules now. It don't matter what the rule is, it's going to break them. And Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Music is introduced. I just want you to see this for a second. Now, this doesn't mean music is evil. I'm just saying, you, I'm saying to you the, this, that yet there's going to come forth from the soul a music that is completely separated from God. Can you see that here? There's going to be music that is of God. This isn't it. <laughs> There's going to be others that play instruments that are God's people. 
And there's going to be praise and there's going to be adoration that's going to go back to the Lord. But these people do not have that intent and purpose at all involved in this. And here's the culture. And here's the civilization. And it's defiance to God. And it becomes attached to a beauty realm. What's wrong with music? Nothing in and of itself. Can it, let's say it this way, can God, and yes, God who is the true author, I believe, of real music, starting with our own voices as well as instruments, but that's not what we're seeing here. So I want us to see this for just a second. It's hard to see it. It's hard to see how predominant it is in our culture, but it answers the why of it. Why is it so predominant? In a, here's its roots. Here's the roots of all that is defiant of God. All that is not from the Spirit of God. Here it is. Isn't that true? Thank you for your wonderful response. Here it is. Whether we believe it or not, here it is. You're going to read it. <laughs> so they're moving into what some would consider, I'm talking about in the soul and in this world, oh, this is wonderful. All this gifting, they'll use that word, all this talent, all these abilities. Now, let's see the full brunt of what's going on here, though. So, as for Zilha, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of implements of bronze and iron. Nothing wrong with that either. Nothing wrong with the herds and the livestock. Nothing wrong with the musical instruments in and of themselves. Nothing wrong with bronze and iron. And nothing wrong with that, except that. Defiance is shut up in the hearts of these people. I want to say something to you. What is being established here is anti-God. That's how angry Cain is. Let's just see the mixture in this, though. Here's the one side of things, and here's what's seething beneath it. And Lamech said, verse 23, to his wives, Ada and Zilhah, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. When he said this, if I'd have been his wife, I'd have walked right out the tent and never gone back. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Bye-bye. Sorry, I got a lot I would say about that. But <laughs> Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. Isn't that beautiful? And if Cain, because this is what's said of Cain, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, Lamech seventy-sevenfold. That's the violence and the spirit of murder that is bound up with this race, our race. That's what's bound up in a soul that's gone astray from God and on its own, living for itself. Murder. And Lamech's boast is no idle threat. He's already killed one man and a boy. So, it doesn't end there. Aren't you thankful that it doesn't end there? Something else goes on. And Adam had relations with his wife again. Thank God. Can you say thank God for that? Thank God that there's someone else going to appear on the scene who is in the will of God and is going to honor the will of God. Isn't that quite beautiful? So, Adam has relations with his wife again and she gives birth to a son and his name is Seth. Thank God for Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring, seed, in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth, to him also a son was born, and, his, and he called his name Enosh. That's a reference to the mortality of man. 
I want us to see that. To the feebleness of man. Notice the difference, let's say it this way, in the spirit of the names of the sons. Cain's are those of pride and boast and arrogance and defiance. Seth's is those of weakness. And what was noted of Cain, of building a city, and thus a civilization, is completely absent in the bloodline of Seth. Here's what's said of Seth's bloodline. Then man began to call upon the name of the Lord. Which one do we want? What does the church want? To have a city or become one to God? Which are we meant to be? Build one or be built it into one? We're meant to be a city set up on a hill. I believe that Seth had some concept from God of what he did not want. And a part of what he did not want was a civilization patterned after man in his fallen state. I think it would be fitting to say what we say all the time. Keep it simple, stupid. And the best way we can say that. Seth's bloodline was not bent on, catch this, building something. But waiting on the Lord. That is a startling distinction, is it not? Especially when it comes to the body of Christ. That's why I started with what I started with last night about building. What do we want? Do we want to build the church? What happens when man builds the church? Same thing that happens when Cain builds a city. Jesus said, I'll build my church. He didn't say anything about us doing it. <laughs> it's the truth. Isn't it, guys? But it's a beautiful truth. Because God's not talking about buildings. Aren't you thankful God's not in love with this building? <laughs> By the way, is anybody in here in love with this building? <laughs> if you are, you need a new set of eyes. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. <laughs> I mean, sort of. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> As buildings go, buildings are buildings. God's not in love with them. His, uh, his, his focus is on people, not the building. Aren't you thankful for that? But I want, to see, I want us to see in the rise of the soul that was prophesied by Paul in the end, how that has risen into the church even. So that the church now, leaders in the church, say it that way, I uh, being one of them, whatever that means, for me it means a target. <laughs> Same thing it means for Brian, for Angie, for Donna, for Ken, for others of us in this room. What being a leader means is being a target. When you're telling people they can't have what they want, that don't go well. When you're telling people, I'm not getting what I want, God is. And if I'm not getting what I want, you sure aren't going to get it. <laughs> I thought it might take a little time for that to sink in, David. <laughs> Ours is not here to get what we want. Ours is here to be unto the Lord. I'm not talking about a meeting. I'm talking about being in here in this life, in this journey. Ours is not about building outward things. Ours is not about building a city. Ours is about being a city. Set on a mountain. That's what, again, Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 5. You're a city set says on a hill. Actually, the Greek word there is mountain. You're a city set on a mountain. Anyway, so my point is the distinction between Seth and Cain is a striking distinction none of what is said about Cain is said about Seth Seth and the people there with him what would be his family are waiting upon the Lord they're calling upon the Lord again they're not trying to build something beautiful isn't it God's building people anyway. He's building people, and he's the only one who can. 
We can't change ourselves inwardly. Can anybody in here make a boast that I can change myself inwardly? Now, I'm not saying you can't change your outward activities, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, can we change ourselves inwardly? Can we make our self inward to be a new person? No one can. Only God can do that. No angel can do that. No demon can do that. Demons want to possess you and control you, but they can't, let's say it this way, they can't make you an entirely different person. They can only control you. Angels have an outward work to do for God's servants. They are ministers to God's people. That's a part of their purpose. But they can't change you. They can't transform you. That's God's work alone, isn't it? And it's Christ in you the way that happens. It's not God out there doing it. It's Christ in you doing it. This is the difference between the former covenant and the covenant of Christ. The former covenant is outward things being adjusted. Do this. Do this. All of that pointing to a person named Jesus. Its fulfillment and fullness was found in Christ. Believe me when I say that. There's not a feast or anything else that does not find its fulfillment in Christ himself right now. Not one day, right now. <laughs> the scriptures are not pointing to someone other than Jesus. They're pointing to Jesus. He, Christ, is the eternal living word to which this written word points directly to. It does not point beyond, past, or other than to any other thing other than the living word, Christ. And if we don't get to the person through this book, we don't know this book. We don't know God's intent in this book. Get to the person. Get in the right relationship. You know what I'm saying? It's a tough place to be in. Well, anyway, back to my point in all of this. Seth's people was completely other than the system of that time, the civilization of that time, the world as it existed in that time. Shouldn't the church be? Shouldn't we as God's people be something completely other than the life out there? that the life of God and the life of all that we see going on here are not even the same, that the life of God is completely other than what's in and of this earth. Let me say that again. The life of God is completely other than what's in and of this earth. There is no comparison. There never was, except for a contrast What's taking place here by the Holy Spirit's doing in what we call Genesis 4 is a contrast. Spirit of God purposefully is bringing a contrast. Now, I'm, I'm going to have to get a little further down the line here with this. Let me say to us, so how long does God allow Cain's civilization to go on? And what does God have to say about that civilization? It's clear what God has to say about it. The flood. That's what he has to say about it. Death to it all. I will destroy it. I will wipe Cain's civilization off the face of the earth. The flood. Quite a statement, isn't it, Matt? <laughs> Doesn't bode well for Cain and his descendants. This civilization is the, ends in the direct intervention of God in destroying the entire earth and all life on it except for eight people and those who are in the ark. The animals, the, you know, what's in the ark? God's pronouncement upon this civilization is that it's evil and that it's death, not life. And what's being called life is actually death. And so God brings the pronouncement of death to death. What if God brings the pronouncement of death to man's ideas right now? Just like he did then. Man's will. Man's desire. Man's intent. Man's purpose. Man's thoughts. Man's high thoughts. 
lofty thoughts, brilliant thoughts coming out of our brain, out of our mind. What if God declares it to be what it absolutely is? Death. What if God makes me to realize that no, as Andy was talking about, no good thing dwells in me? What if I really see the truth as it is in Jesus here? That I need an entirely different life. And that life is the Christ life. And that Christ life is the eternal, uncreated life of the Godhead. And that God's not simply giving me life, making me some kind of a God type being. He's giving me, that would be heresy. He's giving me His Son only. So that Christ is God and we're not. We're inhabited. We're a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Christ in us does not make us God. It makes us possessed if we want it. By God. You're a royal priesthood. You're to be a holy nation. You're to be a people of God's possession. Possessed of God. If we want that. If we're willing. But I don't think we're big on wanting to be possessed because we're not big on wanting to be controlled. Now, all kinds of people are possessed by all kinds of demons, but very few people will allow themselves to be possessed by God. We kind of tremble in, at the thought of it, of giving up our will. But it's our will that got us into this difficulty and this problem. It was the exertion of man's will over God's that led to this death. And we're going to have to exert our will again, aren't we, Miles? And make a choice whether we want Jesus all the way or whether we want to cling to our worthless life. You know what, David? And Man, I've already made that decision, haven't you guys? I've already decided. It's a foregone conclusion for me and most of us, if not all of us in this room. I hope it is for all of us in this room. I gladly walk away from all, all that I once called life and right into the life called Christ. And I want that life coming into me and I want to go all the way into him. I want my will to be, let's say it this way, not my will exalted here or implemented, but your will be done. So you would hope in the flood that God has rid the earth of Cain. Don't you? It's obvious that it's not been. So one last point I want to make here, just looking beyond, I mean, in this passage. I want to look beyond Cain for a moment. <clears throat> And just point something out. I've been saying it already, but I'm going to say it again. So God sends the flood. We have an opportunity, isn't this beautiful, for a new start. There's only eight people left. Surely we won't mess it up again. <laughs> but here's the key to understanding what's about to happen. But man's still the same person inwardly. Man hadn't changed, not inwardly. He's been taught an outward lesson, but he's not really learned anything inwardly. Man doesn't really learn anything inwardly until Christ gets in there. The truth is a person named Christ, and the truth isn't in us until he is. Truths aren't going to help us. The person of truth must possess us. So as long as these people, Noah and his descendants now, as long as these people still have only soul life in them, we're going to repeat everything we just saw, Matt. A different civilization. So they come to the plain of Sinar and they build a city. You can read it right in Genesis. And they build a tower called Babel. And from it comes Babylon. And it, too, is in direct defiance of God. We're going to build this all the way to heaven. We're going to get to God without Christ. So it starts all over again. God comes down, in this instance, looks at the thing. <laughs> if God's going to come down... Let us hope now that it's going to be 
something other, as, as pertains to his people, something other than just pure destruction of what we've built. But I dare say, what we've built is the problem. The church built by man is Babylon, religious Babylon. It's not economic Babylon. It's not even governmental Babylon. But it's absolutely religious Babylon. Revelation 17 and 18, you know it well. It is the destruction of Babylon. God calls it the harlot there in Revelation 17 and 18. So the fullness of Babylon has not been dealt a blow when God comes down and deals with the, the Tower of Babel. In fact, we studied this in history class. I, and I love history, as you guys know. Uh, that there in ancient Babylon, that the temple that was there with Nebuchadnezzar and his father before him, the temple that was erected, or let's say it this way, was used in ancient Babylon was the Tower of Babel. That was their site of religious worship. The Tower of Babel. Now the, the ancient city of Babylon was quite the city built by man's soul again. Had a 1,600 foot span bridge across the river there. Man was not stupid. It had a 100 foot high wall around the entire city. Uh, six chariots could ride side by side on top. The entire army of Babylon lived on the wall. The inner, uh, let's call it the king's palace, was surrounded by a 200 foot high wall that was gold plated so that when the sun hit it in the evenings, it lit up like gold. Thus, God referred to it in Daniel as the kingdom of gold. Beautiful, isn't it? Deadly, isn't it? Death, isn't it, Mike? As beautiful as Babylon was, it is equally deadly. It is a defiant city of God and to God. And in the end, it is this beast system that can rightly be called Babylon. Again, in its three components, however, that we, and it's already upon us, are not only going to face, we already are. My friends, it is religious Babylon that we are in direct conflict with in this very hour. It is the soul risen up again refuting the absoluteness of Christ and believing that something good dwells in man outside of Christ. That there's something redeemable in man in his quality, in his nature, in his work, in his purpose. That's not true. God's judgment of the flood will be again revisited, not with water, but with fire at the end, as God announces again that he does not accept man's Babylon. He does not accept the goodness of man, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it's unacceptable to him. It does not matter what we try to give back to God. People believe that. Well, if you tithe, I don't care if you're, I've had people say this. I don't care if you're an unbeliever or not. If you tithe, God will bless you. Can we just all have a throw up party? <laughs> Can somebody just throw up? <laughs> I mean, projectile vomit, <laughs> that kind of thing. No, that's ugly, but you know what I'm saying? Are we out of our minds? Do you think God is blessing what he hated with Cain? And would not accept. God didn't bless Cain. He rebuked him. Keep your money. That's what God would have to say about that. I do not accept it. And I will not use it. And neither should we. Yeah, read it in the New Testament. Accepting nothing from the heathen, we went out. Go read that again. That's what the apostles had to say about it. No, friends. It's a principle being applied here. 
God does not accept what comes from natural man on any level. He accepts his repentance and his turning to Christ. That's what he accepts. That's what he accepts with us. He accepts our renouncement of our self-life. Our renouncing our soul life. He accepts that. He accepts our turning to the absoluteness of Jesus Christ. That there's no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. And that all must be born again. Or you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that true? Let's just be real for a moment. There's the absolute of God in this. Isn't it beautiful? For us who've been running this race for years, I think it's quite beautiful. For us who, and that's just a say it, us who are older. Anybody over 20? <laughs> Maybe by a year or two, David. Not by much. <laughs> For us who've been in this race for a long time and realized something, man, guys, we've walked away from all kinds of stuff. I don't regret any of it. I hope you don't either. I only walked away from death. I'm thankful to be done with it and delivered of it. I would take Christ over it, and I did, and will again, not regretting any choice but thankful that I can make the right choice, and it is the right choice. And I'm not just talking about outward things, but I'm talking about all matters pertaining to the inward as well. I choose Christ. How about you? I choose to believe God that there's one way in this, and it's God's way or the highway. And Christ is it. Not because Terry believes it, because it's the truth whether Terry believes it or not. It has nothing to do with whether I believe it. The truth is the truth, and Christ is it. That the church must embrace again. The people of God must come to grips with something. Why in the world do we exist? Why are we here? For the pleasures of this life? Or for the purpose of divine representation? To be possessed of God. And for God to use us as a vessel to reveal Himself. And so here at the end, we're going to face this challenge once again. It already is occurring. Babylon on the rise. And with it, a religious Babylon, sorry to say it this way, that includes much of what's called the church. That its source is soul and not Christ. I'm talking about it in every arena. I started this by saying so much of what's being preached from the pulpits is coming from that arena. I don't need to go any further than that. <clears throat> anyway, so we're going to face something. We're going to face what the world is going to say is the most beautiful system that has ever existed on this earth and cannot believe that we, God's people, would have the gall to say no to it. <laughs> Usually when things are thrown at me, they come a lot closer than what that just did. <laughs> of course, they used to throw food at me, but that didn't work because I just ate it. <laughs> Rocks are way better. <laughs> Anytime you want to bring food, David, and throw it at me, I'll be willing to eat it, brother. <laughs> He's a chef, so just thought I'd tell everybody that. <laughs> Poor David. Everybody's going to want food now. <laughs> you won't see any peace, brother. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, the truth of this is, guys, we're going to be facing this now. They will never be able to comprehend why we say no. It ain't going to help to explain it to them. No more than Abel could explain to Cain, well, brother, all I did was obey God. <laughs> Why are you going to hit me with that? <laughs> That's what we're going up against here. This thing that to the rest of the world is so peaceful, so beautiful, if you consent, it's peaceful. And it's beautiful. But if you resist, it is deadly. 
and won't hesitate to murder. We in the South here, not everybody is in from the South here, but we in the South have a bit of a healthy, unhealthy fear of a government going awry. Can you believe I just said that? I mean every word of it. A government with way too much power and way too little oversight. A government that has gone quite beyond the people and their voice. So that we're no longer a government of the people, we're a government of the politicians. There was a time in our history in this nation to where the people were the government. <coughs> and in a republic, that's the way it's meant to be. But we're not dealing with that anymore. We're dealing with a government that can easily enforce its will upon the people in any time, in any way. And it does not matter because they are above the law. The laws that apply to us do not apply to them. We would be in prison if we handled money the way our government's presently handling it. Just using that as an example. I say, man, what's this got to do with anything? I'm simply saying that here in this nation, like not just looking and saying, oh, these other nations. Here in this nation, we're seeing the rise and the demand, by the way, of people for a government to take care of them. If we understood how deadly that drug is, we would not ask for it. The same government that we're asking to take care of us has an agenda wrapped up by its politicians. And that agenda is not Christ. This government cannot be turned by a Republican or Democratic Party. I'm not saying not to vote. I'm saying you need to vote. I'm saying this, though. Our only hope in this and all nations is to turn, let's say it this way, is for the body of Christ to get right with the Lord right here. You know what I'm saying? It is the light of the life of Christ that is the only answer in this. Only Christ can come within and transform a person. I'm not asking for a switching to political parties in the church. I'm asking for a return to Jesus Christ. And for God to inwardly bring forth a people who in this end time can stand, no matter the storm. Because I tell you, Christ is a rock that will be greater than this system of Antichrist. The system of Antichrist is not going to have free reign in all its so-called beauty and power and military hardware, and it's going to have it in a major way. So that who can, the question is posed, who can make war on the beast? Christ, that's who. <laughs> uh, we're not as helpless as what you might think. In the realm of the spirit, there are a whole lot more angels than there are demons. At least twice as many. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Our hope's not in natural weapons. Our hope is in the Lord. In a kingdom that might be invisible, but is eternal and real. So I want to encourage us. I know most of this can be so discouraging to the point that I can say, man, this seems hopeless. In the natural, it is. It cannot be corrected in the natural. But in the spiritual, you guys know this from our own salvation story, our own being born again. It only takes a moment for the Lord to enter and everything begins to change especially how we view things, <laughs> how we view ourselves, how we view one another, doesn't it? How we view God begins to change. I say this to us. If there has ever been a time for us to humble ourselves, ever been a time to, let's say it this way,
to allow God to go deep in our souls and purge us from within, not just outward things. God, thank God he deals with outward things. <laughs> outward things need to be dealt with. But until God gets it inward, we're not safe. And we're not delivered. My prayer for us here, this part of the body of Christ. I mean, guys, I don't envy the city you're in. It has become quite the hub. It's rising prominence in the world is not a healthy thing. Isn't that the truth? No more than Nashville is. I'm speaking to the choir here when I address you guys. Neither is Nashville. Neither are so many of the cities of our nation. I'm not living near a city that's, well, we're just so more righteous than you. <laughs> Who's kidding who? It's the same serpent just with two heads. Nashville and Atlanta are connected. I'm saying this in the spirit now. By God. In intention and in purpose. Satan has connected them in a wrong way. Anyway. What can be done about that? The church humble itself. It is not, again, it is not my intent to get our eyes so on these things as much as it is our eyes back on the Lord. I would, let me say it as clear as I can say it. Please hear what I'm trying to say in my limited language and limited human language. It is yet to appear to us what God has meant the church to be. We've not seen it. There is no comparison between the church and what this world's life is. We've not seen what God has and desires, has for us and desires to do within us. Only little glimpses has been viewed throughout the history of God's people of what it means to be possessed of the Lord. And only a possessed vessel of the Lord will be the right vessel for our time. Not a mixed, half-hearted vessel, but a possessed vessel. I recognize this in my own heart. I'm not finger pointing at any of you guys. I'm saying it to my own heart. God has so much more for us in his son and his son in us. So much more of eternal thought and eternal ground in God life that has no comparison in any of his creation. What are you saying? I'm saying God is not like a created thing in any way. And neither is his life. I said, Man, that just put it out beyond us. It sure did. Because it is. But we can receive it. And he could, we could allow this. We could allow God to do a reset button push. Don't you think? Right on my chest. <laughs> push a reset button. Humble myself before the Lord and confess. I'm doing it right now before him. I've been doing it. I do not know you the way you want me to know you. I do not understand you. I cannot comprehend you. My objective is not so much that. My objective is to know him. And more than that is for his love and Christ in me to produce a love back to him. I can't. It's not a lot. I figured this out. It's not a lot I can do for him. But I can love him. I can love him. God doesn't do me, need me to do a lot for him. He just wants my heart. <clears throat> May the Lord bring to the church in this hour, God's people, the humility that's necessary to embrace our own demise as to what we call church. Embrace it. 
and allow God to raise up something here at the end that will, can truly be God contending through that vessel against these powers. Because I know the end, and so do you. And guess what? Christ wins. <laughs> and it isn't even a battle for him. <laughs> it may seem that way for us, but for him, he's already defeated the devil. He's just going to put the final touches on him through us. So let's stand for a moment. How many, I'm asking this question for a specific reason. How many want to live to see the end? <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> and I'm thinking more along the lines of God's goal of fullness in us, not just an end of time, but God's goal of fullness. You know, I know I needed, <laughs> I let that hang for a moment just to see your reaction. <laughs> <laughs> How many are enjoying old age? No, <laughs> no, 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 don't even answer. <laughs> How many are enjoying this part of old age that we're getting the stuffings beat out of us enough to know that it's not about us, that we need Jesus? <laughs> isn't that true? That's the truth of it, isn't it, guys? It's the same in Texas as it is in Tennessee, isn't it, guys? It's no different. No different what state, what per, what you know, what your bloodline is. We need Jesus, guys. But I believe that uh, God would keep us around long enough for us to see what the church was actually meant to be by us becoming it inwardly. I want to, I, I asked God for this some years ago, please let me live long enough to not simply see it, Stephen, but, you know, be a part of it. Be a part of that that God calls the church, his church. That the, he said the gates of hell, Michael, would not prevail against it. That's an astounding statement, isn't it? It's amazing. I want to be a part of that, don't you, brother? I want to be in him, in that. So that's what I'm asking. I, and and I'm, I'm saying this for a purpose. I'll tell you why. Because the Lord's standing here. That's why. I didn't think of it. He said it to me. So I'm going to say it right back to you. May God give us the necessary will, his will, to live to see the house of God built. May God give us the necessary health physically to live long enough to see the kingdom of God established within a people. I ask that. I, why he's standing here? I'm serious about this. He stands here as the king of a kingdom, but he also stands here as the king of our bodies, the creator of them and the repairer of them. And I ask you, Lord, while you're standing here, to be the healer that you are of your people. Strength and vitality, hope to the hopeless. I ask, Lord, you'll give hope to the moms in this room who are battling for their sons and daughters' salvation. Give them hope, Lord. Not a hope-so hope, but a no-so hope. I pray that even this coming week will be a significant breakthrough in the hearts and in the minds of those, Lord, who are yet to know you. May you break through, Lord. Break through the fog. Break through the lies. Break through the confusion. Break through where the enemy's meant to destroy and kill. And instead, Lord, bring your reality to them. Speak clearly to them in dreams. So clear, Lord, and so purposeful as to your intent eternally for them that, Lord, it will be unmistakable to their hearts. And be a strength in them of will to turn to you. Anyway, be, Lord, healing vitality to people in this room who are suffering and have been suffering physically so much so, Lord, that it would be easier to die than to live. Add years to the lives of people standing in this room. So, Lord, I ask that. As you fill us, add years to this journey for us yeah. so that we may live to see the glory of God in Christ in a people. Yeah. Yeah. I ask for that, Lord. 
I thank you, Lord, that you are able to do this easily, easily. You're able to bring what I believe you would bring to your people, a health, a true health that's coming from the living God within us. Body, soul, and spirit. We ask for that now, Lord. Just receive for a moment as the Lord, I know He's in us, but He's also standing among us. Would you, Lord, spread your garment of wholeness and health over us as a people? I'm not talking about some weird way in this. May the enemy's schemes and purposes be dismissed from our souls, from our bodies, from our hearts, from our minds, from our will. May you as life be released in a measurement in this moment in a measurement of yourself, filling us more than you've ever filled us, more as percentage-wise as we've ever known of you, Lord, fill us. Driving out, your life driving out before it, every form of death. Body, soul, and spirit. Mind, will, and emotions, dealing with the soul. Be the king right now in our midst to where all that is death bows to its death. But we receive you as life, an abundant life. An overflowing life. Not just a life that fills to the top, but it overflows. Such is your life that no human vessel or any vessel can contain but yourself the life that you are. That's just how abundant you are. May you, Lord, by your Spirit, release in us an overflowing of thankfulness and gratitude. May you release in and through us psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Melody within our heart back unto the Lord. May we be a people that are grateful, that are thankful. A people of praise within. A people of adoration within and without, Lord. May we be your people, unashamed, Lord, unashamed of you in any capacity. May you bring forth finally in the midst of your people the high praises of God coming from the inward man released into the airways that are so presently clouded with the filth of the soul. May you do that in Nashville, Tennessee. May you do that in Atlanta, Georgia. May you counter this flood, and it is a flood, this release like out of a frog's mouth that you read about in Revelation, of filth and death and destruction. May you counter it, Lord, through your life in your people. May you release what is truly beautiful your life, your presence, a joy that's unspeakable. It isn't sourced from man. It's you and us, Lord, and you through us. We would ask for that, Lord. Arise, O oh God, and scatter in our minds the greatness of the enemy and cause us to see you again as the one who before you your enemies cringe.
Cause us to behold you again, Lord. Cause us to see you again. Arise, O oh God. Become our vision. <coughs> Become, Lord, what's in our hearts and desire. Become, Lord, what we hunger for. Become, Lord, what we thirst for again. <coughs> Arise, God. Arise. The voice above all voices in this city. Let your voice ring out through your people. The voice above. A voice that defeats all other voices. All challengers must bow. Hollywood is not that voice of this city. You are, Lord. They have never been the voice. May it be so in this city, Lord. May the powers be challenged by the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not have absolute right, nor do they have the blood right of the Lamb over the city. That belongs to you, Christ. May you challenge their false authority by your true authority, your blood right. In Atlanta, we fight, Lord, for this city. We fight for the people that we love in this city, who would be every one of them. The people you love. We fight for the greater Atlanta area as we fight for the state of Georgia. We fight for courage in your people's hearts. Courage in men and women's hearts who are in political arenas, who know the Lord. We fight for their hearts. For them to stand and movable, you being the rock inside of them. May they not bow to money. To mammon, may it have no power over them. May they, may they meet insistence with resistance as they refuse to bow their knees to the pressures that are confronting them in this time. Encourage them, Lord. We pray for them right now. We pray for our leaders, and particularly those who know you, Lord. Be their rock. Be their stability and be their protection to them and their families. I pray for leaders in the body of Christ in this city. I pray, I'm going to say this in the best way I can say it. I pray for the arising of a God, truly God-birthed leadership. Birthed by the Spirit in the Spirit. Men and women who are unafraid to let you be the head of your people again. To allow you to be not only their Lord, but absolute Lord of all those, Lord, who you've given them charge concerning in serving. Give us a leadership that first bows to you and leads the way by example. Give us a leadership that can't be bought, can't be bullied. Refuse mammon and refuse pride and refuse fame and refuse to give in to the pressures that are coming to their position. Give us leaders, Lord, who having bowed to you, stay bowed. Having yielded to you, stay yielded. Give us leaders, Lord, to what they speak is also how they live. As certainly as the descendants of Seth countered 
all that Cain had built may in this city the seed of Christ counter all that is the seed of Babylon. We ask for that now, Lord. We intercede for a breakthrough of breakthroughs in the city of Atlanta and in the state of Georgia. Start with your own people, Lord. Let us return to our first love. And that's exactly where we go right now, Lord. You are our first love, Jesus. May we not forget you. Thank you, Lord, that you answer prayer, especially when you're directing those prayers. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're not silent and you can't be silenced. Thank you that the boastful pride of men and spirits in this city will be brought low. And your will, Lord, will conquer the will of man and of the devil. Do it in us first, we ask tonight, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Thank you, Terry. Very, very powerful tonight, it's an incredible message, and uh, anyway, just so powerful, so clear, I just really feel the Lord's presence here, and uh, Anyway, we want to go ahead and end the session, but before we do, we want to take up an offering, and let's go ahead and...